and then the rest of the lecture will be very different. I'm not a... Good. Okay, welcome to the Simons Electron Microscopy Center's Winter EM course. Our lecture today is going to be on kind of a continuation of last week where we went over sample prep and we're going to introduce the concept of support films. The lecture should be fairly brief and then we're going to have a couple of different sort of hands-on practicals including introducing the spotted on robot that has been developed here. A couple of people seem to be interested in that on Monday so we thought we'd give you guys a chance to see it. Normally Ed is the one giving the lectures. Ed is sick and has completely lost his voice so I'm filling in for him today. My apologies if the lecture is a little rough. They're not my slides and this is my first time giving the lecture so I'm gonna make my way through it as best I can. Little quick bit on uh, sort of the course structure. As you all have noticed, Mondays and some of the Wednesdays kind of alternate here between the conference room and the larger sort of lecture room upstairs. I think there was talk of maybe changing it to just this conference room. The course seems small enough that we can fit mm -hmm. it here. So I think moving ahead, that's probably what we're going to do. The lectures are probably just going to be here from now on. And all of the general clubs and practicals will at least meet here. Uh, the microscopy practical will be going to one of the microscopes, but from now on, we'll just meet here. Uh, I sent out the course handbook. This includes a full schedule from lectures to the dates of general clubs and the dates of the practicals. Uh, here's the recitation schedule, which is just the practicals and the different journal clubs. So again, if you're interested, let me know so that we can get an idea for what attendance is going to be like. And we can start figuring out what dates people want to present their journal clubs on and start assigning you articles based on where we're at in the course and what your research interests are. Okay, so getting started with our talk on sample prep and support films. This is a slide that we showed you guys on Monday that really just covers the breadth of techniques, instrumentation, and resolutions that you can get using various electron microscopy modalities. Um, I wasn't totally sure how to connect this slide, and then Young Z brought up a really, really good point, so I credit this to him. For most of these, you're using basically the same instrumentation, right? For a lot of these, you're going to end up into something like a Creos or another transmission electron microscope, maybe a dual beam SEM. And sometimes you do some sample prep in the dual beam SEM, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, and then you move to the Creos. So you end up using a lot of the same instrumentation, uh, despite the size of the protein, whether or not you're looking at protein itself or organelles, tissues, or entire organisms. And you need some kind of common support, right? Something to place your protein on, place your tissue on, and it has to work inside of all of these microscopes. And the choice of that support is not a trivial choice. It's something that kind of gets overlooked and taken for granted, but uh, it's a very important part of the specimen prep process, so that's why we wanted to go into it a little bit more today. Uh, just a quick reminder to where your sample actually ends up. If you were looking at a light microscope or a transmission electron microscope, the sample ends up basically at the same place. You have your radiation source, some condenser lens, then your sample, an objective lens system. In the electron microscope, you have an additional projection lens system, and then your detector, whether it's the camera or your eye in the case of a light microscope. And in a scanning electron microscope, the setup is very different. Right? You have a sample right at the very end, and you're detecting electrons that scatter off the surface of the sample. So these support films that have to work in different types of microscopes for different types of samples will also end up in different places in the microscope. So there's a lot of variety, I guess. Lots of options. So this is a sort of quick overview and an introduction to some of the terms that we're going to use when it comes to what actually holds our samples. The two main terms that you need to be familiar with, the grid, which is the sort of usually metal mesh that you can see in these images right here, uh, at least sort of in orange, right? That's our grid. They can be made of copper, uh, molybdenum, there are a lot of various metal supports. You can use gold. And then you have foil or some kind of film that you see here in kind of this lighter transparent gray color here. This is carbon, and here it's, oh hey. 
uh, here the support film is form bar. Here it's a mixture of form bar and carbon. Uh, they can be continuous, so completely solid support film. They can be lacy, which we'll have a picture of in a little bit. Just basically have holes in them, but those holes are various shapes and sizes. Uh, or they can be what we call holy, so they have holes in them, but those holes are regularly spaced and have the same shape, the same diameter. Uh, one of the sort of common and initial specimen prep techniques is called negative staining. I don't think you guys saw that on Monday. Sometimes we'll demo negative staining along with cryo, but uh, in this case you're using, you could kind of see it here, this is your grid, and then you have some kind of continuous support film, and you apply some type of heavy stain to your sample in order to get contrast and see your protein. It's usually a good screening step. Uh, but also in this step there are a number of questions as to what kind of support film you end up using uh, will be impractical. I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, you have to pick a support film that's going to be practical for your sample. I'll say that. I mentioned earlier that you can start out with a scanning electron microscope and then end up transferring that sample into a transmission electron microscope. And that's what you end up doing with this technique called cryofib milling, where you freeze usually a cell or sometimes entire organisms transfer into a scanning electron microscope which gives you these images that you see well all of these are scanning electron microscope images and then you use another beam to thin it down so in this case the support film is the sample itself and after you've got something thin you can kind of see it right here right you've got these two blocks that are black where the support film which is the sample tissue or cell has been completely milled away and you're left with this nice thin layer of ice that you can then look at in a transmission electron microscope. And again, choice of support film is important. There are certain support films that are going to be toxic to cells, so if you're trying to grow cells on an EM grid, to do this kind of fib milling and then moving into a TEM, uh, you're going to kill your cells. So you need to find something that not only works from a microscopy perspective, but also the health of your cells. Uh, you guys saw plunge freezing on Monday. If you're preparing a cryo sample, there are a whole slew of support films that you can use, different grid meshes. Uh, they can be patterned differently. Uh, this table kind of demonstrates some of the options that you have. Uh, to kind of explain it, we usually refer to grids by their whole diameter followed by the whole spacing. I think it's usually the nomenclature. So if we say I have a 1.2, 1.3 grid, it means you have a hole that is 1.2 microns in diameter separated by 1.3 microns of space, and you end up something like this. So these are all holy grids, what we call holy grids. They're regularly patterned, same diameter, same shape, same spacing, really nice for automated data collection. You can also have lacy grids that you can see here. So in this case, our film has been there's a bunch of holes punched in it, but those holes are different sizes, different shapes. Usually a little easier to manufacture. I like to use them for sort of initial screening because you have holes of sort of varying sizes, so you can usually find ice thickness that your protein likes. So uh, just another factor to consider with sample prep. You can also have things like finder grids, where the metal mesh itself has letters and numbers, and they're arranged in columns and rows. This can be really helpful if you're doing something like correlated light in electron microscopy, where you do what I showed you before, you take and freeze an entire cell, mill it, and then transfer it to a TEM. You have to be able to sort of navigate all of these different types of images from light microscopy to scanning electron microscopy to transmission, and having something like a big J next to where you want to image can help you find that in different imaging techniques. Traditional substrates for cryo-EM. Uh, I think these are just some things that you have to consider with a lot of the traditional substrates that we use. Does anybody know what probably the most common, let's say, film material is for an EM grid? What's the thing you see the most in like papers and stuff? Carbon. Carbon. Yeah. That's usually the the typical one. Does anybody know why we use carbon? 
more commonly than anything else. I didn't really know this till we talked about it with Ed mm. about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> um, it's just the fact that it's easy. It's cheap, it's easy to manufacture, and uh, I guess this was all possible well before the silicon industry really became a thing. I, yeah. I think there's also another thing with carbon that it has yeah. the con was contraction coefficient. What is it called? The, when you freeze it, it cools down and it has the same expansion coefficient as copper. Right. That was another use of carbon. That's right. Carbon so you usually have some <coughs> copper metal. Yeah, so you have copper and carbon, and when you freeze, they, it doesn't crack. Right. They contract the same amount. So it's a useful thing. Yeah. Uh, it's also relatively electron transparent. Uh, which makes focusing your microscope and things like that a little easier. Um, but your protein can interact with the surface, so there are lots of instances when proteins will preferentially bind to the carbon, which can be a problem. The uh, electron beam itself can induce motion in your grid, so a negative charge builds up on your film and you're shooting it with more negative charge. And they've taken videos and will actually show you one in a little bit where the film just sort of bounces back and forth or drifts a lot, which blurs out your image. And the additional layer of carbon reduces signal to noise per, part per particle, so you have more background scattering from the electron beam traveling through carbon. Um, and there is an overall lack of reproducibility from grid to grid. So anybody who's made cryo-EM grids and tried to look at protein can sympathize with that. It's a nightmare. Uh, this is just a diagram of what a typical uh, TEM specimen would look like. So here you have your three millimeter in diameter metal mesh grid. You zoom in on one of these squares in between it, we have something nice and holy with a carbon film. Again, you can also have something lacy. And then if you look at it, this is what you see sort of in a cross section, where you have this big metal grid bar you have your amorphous carbon support film and then stretched in between these holes right here. Uh, in this case, micron in diameter, you have your ice embedded protein particles. Uh, and you can see you get some protein particles here. You can get protein on top of this carbon here. Uh, and they go by different names from different manufacturers like Quantifoil, C-flat, CryoMesh. So for this example, yeah. this is a gold grid with a C-flat right. mesh. Uh, foil. So it's important. Sometimes we, some people just call them gold grid, thinking that it's a gold grid with a gold foil on top. It can be a C flat foil on top as well. So right. that naming is really like yeah. specific. Right. You can also have copper with gold foil mm -hmm. laid on top of it. Again, mm -hmm. there are lots of options. The and permutations lots of are endless. Endless. Yeah. <laughs> so. And it's usually taken for granted. Usually you pick whatever your lab has or whatever <laughs> they've used. Um, and a lot of times you can sort of beat your head against a wall trying to get a sample to look good without ever considering that. Maybe if you just change the support film, you'd get a lot better results. So Laura mentioned gold grids. This is kind of where things are moving. You'll see more and more papers with structures solved on top of gold grids. Uh, so in this case, we have a holy gold foil on top of a gold mesh grid. So this is like gold on top of gold. Uh, and there are a couple of advantages to this. Uh, so it prevents differential thermal contraction when freezing, which is similar to what Misha said. Uh, the big thing is that it reduces beam-induced specimen movement. So the gold itself actually dissipates all of that negative charge that tends to build up on top of carbon and other support films. So you end up with a much more stable grid inside the microscope. Uh, and combined with direct detectors, allow for near atomic resolution. Disadvantages, it is difficult to focus. So you can see an image right here. So you have your hole with ice, and the gold itself is almost completely opaque. And in order to focus your image, you have to find a spot where it's at least somewhat electron transparent. So usually what you end up doing is taking a picture right at the edge, sort of you know, gold in half of your image and then ice in the other half. But depending on how you set up your targeting, that can be a difficult thing to accomplish. Carbon's nice because you just tell it to focus over the carbon and it's transparent enough, but there's also a signal that it can uh, find focus relatively easily. I wonder if this is just going to keep playing automatically. I don't have to do it every time. Yeah. Do you do the gold plating here where you put a little drop of gold on the wire and it vaporizes it? And then yeah. 
Does it replace the carbon, or does it just like set on top of it? It usually, so it'll set on top of it, and then you can take it into one of the plasma cleaner or glow dischargers and stick it in there for a few minutes, and it blows away all the carbon and leaves the gold. Okay, so you yeah. completely replace the carbon. Yeah. Okay. You can leave it, I guess, if you wanted to, but yeah. <laughs> usually, we were going to demo that, but as you can imagine, uh, evaporating gold is not super cheap, so we don't like to do it unless we're actually making a bunch of gold grids. So, uh, And the process isn't... <clears throat> we'll show you the machine about that. But uh, yeah, we do. We make a lot of our own gold grids here. But uh, over here we have an amorphous carbon support film, and then on the right-hand side we have a gold support film. Uh, and I'm going to play this video, and you guys might have noticed the first time it played, but this image on the right is going to move a lot more. So this is just a movie recording this sort of beam-induced uh, specimen movement. So if I can find... And this is just a... These little boxed-out regions here is just a corner, right? Sort of magnified. So if you watch and see how much this moves compared to how little that moves. I'll play it one more time. Oh. Yeah, so you can see how much this drifts over here in the corner, right? And that's that beam induced specimen movement. So gold grids are nice. Uh, One other thing about gold grids is that we do like exclusively like all tilting on gold grids because it's super right. stable. You can't do it on a carbon grid. So yeah. there's some methods that yeah. require it. Absolutely. Yeah. Some proteins, uh, and some of you might have experienced this, some proteins suffer from an extreme preferred orientation. So one of the ways around that is inside of the microscope, just take your grid and tilt it by a few degrees, depending on how much preferred orientation you have. But you need, you basically need a gold grid because when you tilt it, things become kind of unstable. Uh, so gold grids help prevent that and keep it stable, even if you've got the grid at an angle. This is our obligatory next generation sample prep <laughs> uh, because we have developed uh, new sample prep robot spotted on in house here and we're going to show this to you guys in a little bit or at least the commercial version of spotted on that all of your labs can go buy when it's available for how much <clears throat> for probably not that much more than a venture bot we don't know how much and i'm not going to say how much because i have no idea but the water cooler talk is not much more than a venture bot similar i guess in price um, so we'll have we'll probably have one of the people who actually made this robot and work with this every day talk about it, but we use these self-wicking, hairy-looking grids to prepare our samples. So last time, and I think you guys saw this with the Leica, you pipette microliters of your sample onto your grid and then use filter paper to just smash it and remove 99.999% of it. Uh, in this case, we use a piezoelectric dispenser to dispense picoliter quantities of your sample onto this grid that has all of these copper nano wires that have been grown on the surface, uh, which is going to wick away all of the excess moisture and leave your sample suspended over your holds uh, without wasting as much sample uh, and without that sort of physical blotting process. And then we had a couple of discussion questions, and this is just going to round out a very, very quick lecture, and then we'll get on to the practical stuff. Uh, some of them we already went over. Why use carbon? Anybody have any ideas why the grids are circles and not some other shape? Oh, good question. <laughs> Square would be better. Maybe. The edges become a problem for I mean, conductivity. It's probably easier to design a circle because uh, you know if you're trying to handle something that's three millimeters. The square trying to get to the right orientation in, you could easily cut up your grid. Or if the circle is probably easier to just lay down into an inset circle. And then also, if it's, it does build up charge, I feel like it's probably better to have it in a circle than to have it at a square. This column is circular? Because the Lines first holder circular? was circular. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's hardware limited. I have no idea. Oh. <laughs> wow. Gotcha. <Yikes>. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um. I think those are all very good points. <laughs> I really don't. And then Ed proposed this question, and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and Ed, Ed, no, he can't. He lost his voice. He can't talk. So he was just like, why is it a circle? See ya. <laughs> um, it's probably 
the column is a circle. That Why makes sense. Why donuts are circular? Yeah. Yeah. It's easier to make. Yeah. It looks nice. Uh, I really don't know if there's any one or even a few specific reasons, but it's a shape that seems to work well. Handling kind of makes sense. If it's a square, you've got to make sure that it... If it's basically anything else, you have to make sure that it goes in yeah, to the holder at a very specific angle. Right, A circle is doesn't matter. Young Z brought up that uh, maybe it's because of the design of... If you're familiar with the reason why manhole covers are supposedly circles instead of any other shape, is that it, it's the only shape that where it doesn't matter what angle you rotate it, it won't fall in to the hole that it's meant to sit on top of. Basically, any other shape, you can rotate it some way, and it'll fall into it. In terms of the square, the square, the square if you put the... You put the... The short end through the hypotenuse, you can fall that way. Yeah, oh, it'll just fall yeah. through. Whereas the circle... You can fall the it. It'll always just kind of, like, sit on top. It doesn't, fall, the it doesn't yeah. fall into the yeah. column. Yeah. And I think that probably might be it. That also makes sense. Yeah. Sure. Uh, this is a more general question. How does the sample impact the choice of your support film? How does the sample impact the choice of support film? And if you haven't done any sample prep, this could be a good question for maybe some of our staff scientists or people who have worked with these kind of things. So proteins love carbon, so sometimes your protein will stick to the carbon, mm -hmm. so you switch to another non-carbon support film. Yeah. Sometimes protein like carbon, and then you would actually have a carbon on the back of your hull, so it sticks to the carbon. Mm -hmm. It's another thing you can do that we didn't totally mention. You can take some of these holy grids, things that, <coughs> well, things that look like this. So normally it's some kind of support film with a hole punched in it, and it's just over vacuum inside the column. You can actually lay an additional support film, something like a popular one that seems to be doing some cool things is graphene, single layer carbon graphene that is almost completely transparent, but, or even just really thin carbon, right? People have done that before. If your protein really likes carbon, you can lay an additional layer of thin carbon over top of this hole uh, and maybe prevent some of the sort of deleterious effects of proteins absorbing to the air water interface stuff like that if you have a really small protein uh, gold grids tend to get very nice thin ice is one of the kind of anecdotal reasons for using them so if you're working with something that's really small where even I think we've said what 500 nanometers is kind of the upper end of what is transparent to an electron beam I work with a protein that if I had 500 nanometer thick ice, I wouldn't see it at all. If I had 200 nanometer thick ice, I wouldn't see it at all. So moving to gold grids allowed me to get a lot thinner ice in addition to the whole less beam induced movement thing. Um, how does the choice of support film impact your sample? This is actually kind of just another way of thinking about the question that we already had. You can use carbon, and if your protein likes carbon, it'll absorb to it. Uh, and then this one, I didn't know how to phrase this as a question, but any commercial considerations? Uh, so if you're making your own homemade grids, oftentimes they're pretty uh, inconsistent. So getting commercially supplied grids, at least you can rely on them being like really consistent from batch to batch. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're making your own carbon, there'll be a lot of variability. So. Especially with thickness problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. There's also an issue with back order stuff if you want to get it commercially. So I've really only made my own gold grid. So they're copper grids with a carbon film that I then coat with gold and then get rid of the carbon because I would have to wait six weeks to get grids if I ordered them commercially. Pretty much done. We're just going over some brief discussion questions. But even grids from commercial manufacturers aren't always completely consistent. Mm -hmm. They can also vary. That's right. That's right. Um, I just screened one yesterday and uh, used plum foil and they mm -hmm. did not remove the carbon completely. Oh, that happened. Yeah, yeah. That happens. That's actually very good. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we use that to, you know, the, just the dose. Yeah, yeah. Correct the stigmatism. Yeah. Yeah. 
So sometimes it can I, be I nice. love when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it can be nice. One of us has an issue that we saw before that's a lip on the hole. Which you, when you punch in the hole, they actually it kind of like punching into the wall. It kind of opens up, plays up. Yeah. And that actually makes your eyes really thick. Yeah, so if you're looking at it in a cross section similar to. Where's that view? So if you're looking at something like this view, you have your carbon. Oh, is this the. Okay. It's okay, we can carbs. erase it. Okay. We'll figure it out. Yeah, it's awesome. Okay. <laughs> all right, I'll do it on. Because people do it over there all the time. Yeah. Do it on the wall. Do it on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you just that's 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 it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> so if you're looking at it like a cross section, you end up with these lips that kind of look like that or something similar. So the carbon isn't terribly flat right at the edge of the hole. So you end up with ice that kind of looks like this instead of didn't have that lip, you can imagine you might have something thinner. So, Hence the introduction of C-flats, which were supposed to have a much flatter opening at the hole. Also, um, oftentimes, even though they give you these measurements for like 1.2, 1.3 micron holes, mm -hmm. you go to a scope and you actually measure the diameter and it's like 10 to 50% off from that. Mm -hmm. That's pretty common. Um, it's not like a total loss of an experiment, but it's, I wouldn't rely on those numbers to be like totally accurate. Right. So. Yeah. I think I heard somebody mention that the holy grid, because they're regularly aligned, it's more easy <laughs> for automation for uh... Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's something that needs to be more of the program on the scope itself to, to actually set the distance to measure? Yeah, that's what we have. We have that in Legend on okay. the software that we use to control the microscopes here. That's the one of it's actually also one of the things that make gold grids really nice. So the way that that targeting works and what Gil was talking about is you can set up our data collection software to automatically find all of these holes. Uh, so you kind of go through and kind of teach it what the contrast should look like for holes that have good ice thickness. Uh, but it's all based on contrast. So super easy to do automated hole targeting uh, if you've got a gold grid because the difference between the film and the hole itself, even if the ice is thick, uh, is basically nothing. Whereas some of these carbon, I don't know if we have one that really shows it, but well, you can kind of see it here. Uh, the difference in contrast between the carbon and the ice itself isn't all that much. but. It's pretty stark if you've got gold grids. Someone from the YouTube chat responded to your question about why grids are circular. Oh, yeah? And they said, is it because the sample droplet forms circles? So naturally, if you just put a droplet of your sample down, it just makes a circle. Yeah, and I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Their name is Haunted Toilets. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. In regards to the regular lattice as well, slightly only grids. Um, when you do random conical tilt, you wanna when you tilt your grid, you wanna have some fiducial. So actually, the grids are special in that they are grouped in the three by three nine nine groups of squares, nine, nine groups of poles that are spaced a bit further apart. So you can see nine by nine by nine by nine, um, three by three by three. We've got and something like this. Something like this, yeah. So when you, so so that will allow you when you tilt it to be able to 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 mark back which holes are where. Because right now we have everything the holes are all uniform. When you tilt it, you don't know which holes are what. Go back. Oh. Yeah. So those are special kind of grids. But right now, not all people do when <laughs> square so grids. Yeah. Yeah. So Ed just slacked us a picture of these 1.5 millimeters. So this is half the diameter of a circular grid. And these are used for tomography. Um, the size allows for further tilt in TEMs with small pole piece holes so that you're able to tilt it more without hitting those pole pieces and starting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. So there are square grids. Yeah. They're smaller than the right. circular that ones. That makes sense. There are also, we didn't talk about it much, there are silicon nitride support films, which aren't terribly common. They're very expensive. Uh, I don't know how well they necessarily <laughs> work for single particle samples. Uh, I have heard of a couple of labs using them to grow cells on top of because the silicon nitride functions very similarly to like a glass 
cover slip. So if you can grow your cells on a cover slip or even in a plate, you should be able to grow them on these grids without changing much. And you can coat them with fibronectin or whatever else you have to do to get your cells to grow if they're adherent. Uh, those are nice in that you can actually get grids that don't have grid bars at all. So you have a three millimeter grid and then you have about a one millimeter square window in the center. And it's all one solid support with a bunch of holes punched into it. Um, so it's another option, especially if you're doing more cellular tomography. Anybody have any questions about different kinds of support films? Has anybody made samples and had issues or stories of bad support films or good support films? Well, we just had this perfect example with Beta Gal where the same day made grids, put it on a carbon grid, it looks so aggregated and precipitated and whatnot. It just looks horrible, which you would make a judgment that it's the biochemistry is wrong. And then exactly the same thing on the gold grid two minutes later. Looks perfect. So, support matters. Yeah. Don't forget your support film <coughs> when you start making protein. It can be a night and day difference. Yeah. Don't get discouraged if you look on the carbon and it looks bad. You try try, try gold else first. Yeah. You can make Actually, a try gold right away. Yeah, usually <laughs> don't bother with anymore carbon. when I go to cryo, I start out <coughs> with gold lacy grids. I like you can't do automated hole targeting with these lacy grids because, yeah. yeah, it's a mess. But I get a really, really wide range of ice thickness so I can find spots that are too thin and I know not to look there. And it might give me an idea of what diameter of holy grid I'll need when I actually want to do large, like, automated data collection. But that's my personal thing. Uh, so with that, I think we're gonna like. Oh, do you have anything else? Go yeah, ahead. If, I mean, for the gold and camera, so this cool case with Jenny, which was, was from here last time, and she had a protein actually that had preferred orientation absolutely on the on the carbon grid, and she froze on the gold grid, and they also had a preferred orientation, but ninety degrees <laughs> to it. So basically, because of that, she could self destruct because she had two absolutely uh, <laughs> orientations and ninety degrees to each other on gold and carbon, which is quite lucky. I think about it as the best way to have two different orientations. So yeah. yeah. I don't know why that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I think with that we're probably going to wrap up the lecture portion unless anybody has any other questions and we're going to move on to more of a practical section. I have one more question. So yeah. when you make gold uh, like preparation, it has to, like, because of the machine of glow, what, what is, what that means? What Um, mm -hmm. glow machine. Glow discharge? Glow plasma discharge. thing? Okay. What, is, what is happening? So the first thing that you do is you take literally like a gold wire and put it in there and I'll show you the machine but you sort of wrap this gold wire around this post and then the machine heats up and evaporates the gold and it sputters it onto the grids which you also keep inside of that. The question is about Same gold chamber. evaporation or glow discharge? Those are two different oh. things. So there's gold evaporation, right? right? You sort of evaporate all of the gold atoms on top of your grid. Okay. And then there's glow discharging, and we can show you uh, a discharge. glow discharging machine. Uh, it's a chamber that pumps down into a vacuum, so now you have your grid sitting inside of a vacuum of this machine. You introduce some kind of gas. We use hydrogen, oxygen, argon, or you can just use air. Uh, pump it in and heat it up to form a plasma. And it basically, we use it to, you can use it to clean grids. If you stick a grid in there for a really long time, it will basically remove all of the carbon from it, which you obviously don't want if that's your support film. But if you've made a gold grid, you have a carbon support film, and then on top of that, you've got gold, but that carbon is gonna build up charge and is gonna cause this beam induced motion, so you wanna get rid of it. So you stick it in this glow discharger, which just hits it with this gas plasma for you know, a few minutes and it removes all that carbon. And we also do it to make the grids uh, more hydrophilic. Because carbon itself is very hydrophobic, but if you expose it to one of these plasmas for 30 seconds, it doesn't damage the carbon, but now it's much more hydrophilic, so your three microliters of protein sample actually spreads out over the grid. So if you compare like a grid that's been glow discharged and not glow discharged and you add the same sample to the glow discharged grid, you'll see the wetting, part, like the properties of it, it just 
falls nice and flat. Whereas on the grid that you don't blow the charge, it's just like a nice little mice out. So like a little. It's so like if you yeah. pipetted water on a pair of or something. Yeah. You just have like this little ball that sits yeah. on top of the grid. Yeah. You want it to spread. Yeah. And cover so. the whole grid. Is that because the grid has a charge to it, or is it because you sort of, if you're doing this with oxygen, you're sort of like forming an oxide layer that becomes? I don't know exactly. Is it it's got to build up. I'm not sure anyone knows exactly yeah. the chemistry that's yeah. happening. Okay, so magic happens. <laughs> so somehow the Which is like electrons or cleans the hydrophobic film or forms free radicals that are next hydrophilic. That's that's the bottom. No, but so for oxygen, you get the, you get negative charge for hydrogen. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can yeah. you can so you can, can play with it. Yeah, um, yeah, it's the actual chemistry. Not sure, but uh, you could even go more finely and. I mean, Chris Russo is trying to make it such that you have a graphene film and you can blow this stuff with specific additives on it. You can actually add specific groups on it that, that are more like bigger moieties, like chemical moieties. Like functionalize. Yeah, mm -hmm. actually functionalize it uh, specifically. We're not doing to that extent yet because we're not putting in like EKN here have some weird stuff that might explode <laughs> the thing. So. <laughs> but it's being done so that they can, you can actually functionalize your whole layer, you know, <laughs> substrates. Yeah. So glow discharging, also another important important step on sample prep. And what gas you use, how long you glow discharge. Yeah. All of these things matter, and these are all things that you can optimize while making your samples. So I think we're ready-ish. Yep. Yeah. Um, why do you use those mixture of gases, and why do you use argon? I don't, I don't, I just usually stick with hydrogen and oxygen myself, but uh, I know for gold grids, Laura likes to use argon. I think you use argon for gold. Yeah. Or maybe I don't like also. to use it. I just took it off the paper. I don't know why they used it. <laughs> so. Yeah. Which paper did they got from? I don't know. Russo from? Yeah. Probably I use that argon. super mania paper. Oh, I oh, use argon because it was on the machine and we just quote. So. Oh, no, I got this from a paper. Yeah, so I used it because it was from. Yeah. So when I was getting trained, somebody was like, if you're making a continuous carbon grid, use this recipe on the machine. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Cool. It's the one that I gold. use. Glory gold, yeah. And then someone said, oh, if you're making gold grids, you can actually just use the same one. It works fine. I mean, and I tried it, and it worked fine. Uh -huh. So <laughs> that's why. <laughs> it is easy to use ambient air. The Pelco, we have several yeah. one actually uses ambient air, and I think that's why they use a lot. You know, in Qingwa, they use it a lot. That's why I had it. And there is, that I think is the difference between plasma cleaning and glow discharging. Someone asked me that, I think during my qualifying exam. And what is the difference? One of them is ambient air, and the other is like a specific gas, yes. like hydrogen or oxygen. Uh, so if and you I don't can't remember which one. Glow, so glow discharge is air. Glow discharging is ambient air. Plasma, plasma cleaning with is gas. with a specific gas. Okay. So again, you'll probably just use whatever so whoever trained you, whatever they use, you'll probably use <laughs> until something goes wrong and you get desperate enough to try to vary glow discharging conditions. It just describes all those things. Yeah, yeah, there it is, pretty much. It's not much different. Okay, so I think Deja is going to demo making grids with a continuous carbon support film. For negative staining. For negative staining. So she's evaporated some carbon onto some mica and she's gonna float it over top of grids and you'll get to see how that's made. And then how many people are gonna be doing the practical stuff? Obviously not our staff. So what, what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so everybody can probably just do it at once. Yeah, okay, so what's that? Laura will be actually going to the black microscope to look at some grids and then we'll be doing a spot off demonstration with Ben And then we back in here? Okay. Yeah. If people have questions or want to chat, you can leave your stuff here. It's fine. But we're going to head out into the lab. <coughs> Don't forget to remind them no class next Monday. Oh, no class next Monday. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for clapping. <laughs> no class next Monday, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So a week from today is going to be Fourier transformations and image formation with Lorenzo.